judges. Now, the introduction is a little bit long, but it's all right. <laughs> so we'll start. I'm um, just in type which way. <laughs> no longer now, Makila. So we'll start with the author. Now, according to Jewish teachings, they like to say that Samuel wrote the book, but actually modern day um, modern day scholars have discredited that and they kind of all agree that they don't know who wrote it. <laughs> so officially it's down as a book that is an unknown author. Now its purpose is to provide a historical and theological rec record following Israel's possession of Canaan and their need for a king because they had rejected God as their king. Because that was not God's original plan for them. You know, he wanted to be their king, to lead them. You know, I brought you this far, I brought you into this land, I've prepared for you, and I'm going to leave you. But they just wanted a king. You know, they wanted a physical body, a being that they could look up to and be like, yeah, we're following you. So, but really, the intention was for them not to have a king. Now, the content of the book, if we've read it, is a cycle of sin and deliverance. We just see that over and over. Um, they start going into idolatry, immorality. God raises a leader, aka a judge, to save them. They have some time of peace for a while. Then the cycle continues. About six, seven times that cycle goes on for. Can you imagine? Um, and then another part of the book is obviously the judges. They're a main part of the book. And we have two stories of religious and um, moral decline. Does anyone know which stories I'm talking about? Is it about the, the prophet who married? No, it's a Levi married um, a prostitute. Yeah. Well, if we go to the Levite, is one of them. Um, chapter 17, verses. 7 to 30. Anyone would like to read? So 17 verses 7 to 30. To, yeah. The young man, the young lover's sons, back to Bethlehem in Judah, who was the moment in the queen of Judah. Let's go in session of some other places to stay. In, in his way, he came to Micah, house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah asked him, where are you from? I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah. He said, and I have looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, leave with me and be my father's Fathers and priests, and I will give you ten shackles of silver in here, your clothes and food. So the Levite agreed to live with him, and the young man was to ask him one of his sons. Okay, so so the Levite agreed to live with him, and the young man was to him like one of the sons. That Micah installed the Levites and the young man became his priest. Okay, um, yep, stop there. So that's the first part of that story. And the second part is 18, chapter 18, verses 18 to 21. When these men went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the other household gods, and the carved idol, the priest said to them, what are you doing? They answered him, Be quiet, don't say a word. Come with us and be our father and priest. Isn't it better that you serve a tribe and clan in Israel as priests rather than just one man's household? Then the priest was glad. He took the ephod, the other household gods, and the carved image and went along with the people. Putting their little children, their livestock, and their possessions in front of them. They turned away and left. Amen. Amen. So, this 
lead by it. Um, he had made an arrangement with Micah that he would be his priest, he's getting a wage, you know, he would watch over the household and they would go to him for advice from God. Now, and in these times, we know it's repeated over and over in this book, that there was no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So he's now a priest. He's one of the few remaining that's supposed to be a connection to God, that's supposed to be a moral example, that's supposed to be someone they can look up to and follow, is now going with them. So after they told him to be quiet the first time, instead of when they now said what they're doing, him being like, no, that's wrong, I'm not going with you, put the stuff back, you know, that's not right, he was glad. The Bible says he was glad. <laughs> and he now even took the gods and the, the carved images with him and they now strutted along their way to be their priest because they were going to double his wages and also they told him, you know, why be a priest over one man's household when you can be a priest over a whole name, um, a tribe? Like, you know, it's better. And in his mind, yeah, that was better as opposed to the promise that he's made. So he decided to just take the gods and go with them. And then he's supposed to be their example. So that's the first... Um, immoral decline, or moral decline, should I say. The second one is the tribe of Benjamin. Now, do we know what they did? Yeah. yeah? What did they do? So the Levite, this same Levite, now married his um, prostitute, the concubine, and he went into um, uh, this part of town where it was all on his journey. And you know, a gentleman in the city saw him and said, come, I'll entertain you, stay in my house, just don't stay in the city center. And then the men, the wicked men in the center, now went onto the old man's house, start banging on the door, bring out this guy, we want to sleep with him, we know he's there. And they were like, no, you can't do this vile thing. Like, this is a man. You no, know, I'm not sending him to you. But they persisted. No, we want him. So the Levite, you know, took out his concubine and placed her out. And as we know, they raped her and did all sorts of things to her the whole night through. And they dumped her on the doorstep where she died. Now, what the Levite did is actually pick up her body and take her to the rest of his journey chopped her up into 12 pieces, which he sent to the other tribes to say, look at this despicable thing that you know the tribe of Benjamin have done. Like, what are we gonna do about it? So everyone gathered together, all the leaders of the tribes came together, they had a meeting, they decided they're going to pay back Benjamin because this is not acceptable behavior. <laughs> so, and as we know, they fought, they won, the tribe of Benjamin went from thousands to 600, um, but in the end, they, they did what was right in terms of, okay, we're going to teach Benjamin that you can't do this. But then in the end, they still compromised because they went and got 400 women, but that was 200 short of the men of the tribe of Benjamin. So they said to um, Jabesh Gilead, yeah? Yeah, yeah? yeah, so they said to the tribe of Jabesh Gilead, what we're going to do is... <laughs> You know, in our festival, yeah? Let's, you know, um, have a party of what the Benjamin men are gonna do. They're gonna come in, take, you know, 200 women and marry them. But it's all right, because you didn't technically give them That's your- That's children of Israel. Yeah. yeah, you didn't technically give your daughters to these men. Yeah. So, you know, it's all right, just allow them because we can't let this, you know, tribe diminish. And you know, as I was reading that, what I actually pictured was what the, what are they called? Politically correct word. Uh, travelers. Yeah. That's what they do. The men at parties, you know, they like to party. <laughs> yeah, just the correct word is travelers. So, <laughs> um, at parties, they like to party, they love to celebrate. 
if they're ever going to spend money on anything, it's going to be a celebration, a, co a communion, a wedding, something. But that's how they spend money. So at these parties, boys who are looking to be married go and grab the girls and literally take them to a corner. And that's a sign to everyone and to her that he's saying, you're going to be the one I marry. That's literally how they get their women. I was just like, ah, is this where they got it from? So they think, can you imagine? Because <laughs> that's an ongoing tradition to this day. That's how they live. So we can see where some people get their philosophies. Mm. Now, Apple, interesting fact. When reading the book, it seems like the judges had to deliver Israel as a nation every time. But actually, they delivered different judges, delivered different tribes at different times. And sometimes the deliverances coincided in time. So like one tribe's journey of 40 years, um, 35 years into it, another tribe's deliverance starts. Yeah? So even though as you're reading it, it sounds like it's... But if you think about it in terms of everyday life, you know, we're here having Bible study somewhere else in the world, someone else is doing something else. <laughs> um, but it will all happen in this year. So that's kind of something I found out. Which is simple, but I was like, yeah, duh, that makes sense. <laughs> um, like for example, when Gideon delivered a tribe, he was delivering, let's say, a tribe in the north. At the same time, Samson was delivering a tribe in the south as opposed to one nation being delivered. Yeah. Okay, a for introduction, how to study history. Now, according to David Pawson, um, when studying history, because the Bible, the majority of the Bible is historical. So when studying um, the historical books, that there's four categories in which to look at, you can look at the book. So the first one being personalities. Now, for our book, the personalities are definitely the judges. <laughs> Even says they were charismatic people that God raised. So, the second would be the people or the nation. So, for us, it would be the tribes of Israel in the book of Judges. The fourth is to look out for patterns. And clearly, we know the pattern of this book was sin, deliverance, sin, deliverance. <laughs> um, and you can look at the purpose of it as well. Now, the purpose of this book is to show us that um, Israel, okay, to get Israel to recognize God as their king. That was God's plan, and that was God's purpose, but they just refused throughout the whole book. Every time he made the leader, you know, and even the leaders were like, was it Gibeon that the people asked, you rule over us, and let your son and your grandson, you know, rule over us, and he was like, no. I'm not here to rule over you. God is your king. You're supposed to follow God. Yeah, I'm just here temporarily to, you know, save you guys. <laughs> but I'm not your king. I'm not going to allow you to make me an idol and worship me and my family. No. But still, that wasn't enough. They wanted a king. Now, lesson one from um, this book is actually to do with the judges. So I've got God's plans concerning the judges. Okay. Let's see if we go back. How many judges were there? <laughs> Do we know their names? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's there's Tola. Yes. 
because God now had to use a woman to kill him. So, God's original plan is for the men to be at the forefront of battle. Women may, may be used in battle, but the men are to spearhead the fight. Now, chapter 9, verses 50 to 54 is an example of where another woman was used in battle.
Israel went from this cycle of sin and deliverance, sin and deliverance, <laughs> when Joshua was still alive, um, and that generation with him, they were the first generation. They knew God, they had walked with him um, through, from Judah to, Egypt. from Egypt to Canaan. They had walked that journey. They had seen God, they had experienced God. They had spoken to him one on one. That personal transformation, that personal journey with God, they had taken. So their salvation was, was solid. You know, it was on solid ground, it was unshakable, they know the God they serve. But the second generation are those who know God through their parents. Like growing up in church, but they never really have that personal relationship with him. So they go to church every Sunday, you know, they're there at the front, they sing the songs. But they don't really know this God that, you know, they're singing to or they're praying to, they're just it's their parents. What, what God has done for this family. If you, you know, it's their parents who, <laughs> who's telling them this is what God has done. So, the second generation, hmm, we'll come back to them, but yeah, that's the second generation. Now, there's the third and fourth and so on generations who have basically inherited God. They, but they don't really know Him, they don't know what Christianity is all about. It's just, this is what we do. You know, we pray, we go to church, we, but even their own parents sometimes, they don't even know because this is third generation. So it's just, yeah, they've inherited a lifestyle that they don't understand. And this is what was going on with this generation that was in that cycle of sin and deliverance. Because at the middle of chapter two, Joshua dies. And it says, let's go to chapter two. had been joined with their fathers and their forefathers and this generation did not know God. They knew nothing about him, what he had done, how they even came to the land of Canaan. They didn't know nothing, they didn't care. <laughs> so they had not had that personal encounter and walked that journey with God. So they couldn't take on a God that they don't know. And that's what's happening in our generation now. You know, there's people who, their grandparents, ah, they're on fire. It's their grandparents that drag them far. Really, they don't know God. They've never experienced him. Even when their parents talk about him, it's like, yeah, whatever. They don't know him. So, that kind of generation, how, how do we avoid our children and grandchildren being like the second and third generation Israelites? I wanted us to discuss this point because it's a serious issue because these are the next generation we will leave them behind they will be left to be the leaders of this world you know the politicians the mothers the aunties the uncles they will carry on this life when we leave but what life will they carry on a life of god or a life of the world so how do we ensure that our children and our grandchildren know god personally and he's not just Yes, I'm God. Yeah, I go to church on Sunday. Yeah, I'm a Christian. But they live every single part of their life as an unbeliever. How do we avoid that? Yeah. Encourage them to read the word. Yeah. The word says, teach the child the way you should go and go to the word. And also, scripture tells us to be different than the word in the night. Yeah, 
involved in the things of God, how we read, how we pray, um, and this will help them to also grow as a Amen. Anyone else? Sarah? Okay. Praise the Lord. Um, as parents, we must endeavor to be sure about our children's salvation because um, the, pro the problem with many uh, Christian uh, parents, uh, they just assume that their children are saved because they go to church with them, they do every ordinance, whereas within their hearts, these children, they don't really, really they, they, they have so many questions to be answered. And in situation whereby the Christian parent has been unable to answer their questions, it creates some doubts in them. And children could be silent while passing through their face. Just for them to turn out to be adults, then they'll decide to do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. So as Christian parents, we should endeavor to engage them in conversation about Christianity, about God to explain to them and use our lifestyle as a showcase, as an example for them to identify and to see the truth of, of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Um, what I would just add to it is uh, I, would, I would just go on the parents themselves. What do they know? Mm. Until you, you know something, you can't transfer or teach anyone. Mm -hmm. So when the parent is a child goer, what 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 have they got to give these children? Mm -hmm. That biblical foundation or the godly foundation of the religion. There's nothing. They the parent themselves are empty. Mm -hmm. Empty of the word, empty of their salvation, empty in what they believe. So it ends up like a generational thing, going to church. Mm. We are Christians, carrying that name, we are Christians. Mm. We go to church, yes, but the parents, starting from the parents, that voidness, that emptiness, that no knowledge whatsoever in the world. So they can't really teach their children. Mm. Yeah, it starts from the parents. Christians behave 
is what makes their children and their grandchildren have that distance from God. They don't know him. They don't want to know him. Because why should I serve this your God and be living how you're living when I can just say I don't serve this God and live the same way you're living? <laughs> I prefer that. At least that's honest. But what you're doing, no, I'm all right. I don't want it. <laughs> so it starts with the parents, absolutely. Um, do what you're telling them to do. And know God for yourself. Yeah. Because just the Israelites refused, this generation refused to know God for themselves. They wanted to know leadership through a king. But God was saying, no, here I am. I'm your king. I want to lead you. I want to be the one who guides you in this life. They're saying, no, 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 no. You stay there. We want a king. <laughs> and this is what God is saying to us. I want to lead you. I want you to have a relationship with me. Not your pastor. Not the leaders. That's not who... Yeah, they're there to guide you and, you know, show you stuff and teach you stuff. And, you know, they might be more spiritually advanced than you. So there's things that they'll know that you can ask. Yeah, they're there to guide you, but they're not your God. I am the one who you're following. I'm the one who needs to lead you. And I'm the one who you need to look to. But I'm like, no, no, I want, I want pastor. I want that one, that deacon, that one. Yeah, ah, praise that one. <laughs> yeah. We must know God for ourselves and have personal relationships. And I was thinking, I was actually asking, okay, God, in terms of this question, as a church, what are we doing that helps that, that aids that, or what is there that we can do that aids that, that maybe we're not doing? And actually, I was encouraged in terms of the way we involve our children. Because we don't do children's church, they're not, you know, in another room coloring, you know, hearing the sugar-coated, watered-down version of the word. They're here with us, hearing the word in its truth, in its entirety, in the undiluted version, <laughs> you know, and they get to hear us speak about the word and relate it to our everyday life. So they get to hear practical advice on how to deal with the issues that they will go through, you know, because their, their issues might not be our issues, but to them in that moment, you know, that argument you had with your best friend is the end of the world. Like, your life is over. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whereas for us, we're like, I bet tomorrow you'll be finished hugging, you're back to normal. But for them, that's the end of the world. Their world is over. That situation is so huge. <laughs> you can't talk to them. <laughs> so by them being involved and hearing the word and hearing how we give practical advice, they also can apply it to their lives and think, okay, well, I've heard them talk about this in church, and this is how so-and-so dealt with it. Okay, I'll try that. <coughs> so actually, yeah, the way we include them, the way we teach them, they have their own journey group, but everything is still in line with what the adults are being taught. That is really a way to help them, because children hearing the diluted version doesn't help them. This is like the cartoon version. No. That's been changed and it's made sweet. Oh, it's not appropriate for children. So we'll take out the part where he had a concubine who was raped and you know, just tell them. They need to know. People are raped on the streets, so they need to know. Um, and hearing about sex, they need to hear about sex in the church. Because our children have these questions. They might not ask you. Because <laughs> they're like, oh, that's all great. I can't ask my mom that. I can't ask my dad that. But they have these questions. They're very interested. They're very curious. Children are like sponges. Every, they just want to take in knowledge. But if we're not giving it to them, the world is giving it to them. Yeah. So we need to be filling them constantly with God. This is his word. This is his will. This is who you are in him. This is where he wants you to be. This is you and God. You and God. So when the world now tries to tell them rubbish, they can stand. And they can be like first generation converts. Mm -hmm and not second and third diluted, no. So, yes, Lord, we will have our children and our grandchildren who will install in them the tools, the knowledge, the wisdom to be first generation yes, Lord. converts, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God. They will know you for themselves. They will have personal interaction, personal relationship, Lord God. They will have a personal prayer life, Lord God, Father. Personal relations with you, Lord God, Father. They will know you as God. They will know you as Father. They will know you as their King, Lord God, Father. They will not look to no man, 
Lord God, Father, to lead them, but they will look to you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. the next generation leaders because for example in some churches if the pastor is not there the church literally cannot function <laughs> like <laughs> the pastor might be stuck in traffic somewhere they will not have a service because they're sitting there waiting for pastor and that's an issue like <laughs> as a leader those that you're leading should be able to function without you because what you've learned as a leader and all the tools and skills that you have, you're passing them on. Yeah. But if they can't function without you, there's an issue. And that's what was happening. Without the leaders, they could not function. And why? I wonder, I do wonder why, because the leaders led them well. And for example, like Gibeon, who told them, I'm not the one you know you need to ultimately follow. It's God who you need to follow. It's God who's your king. So they gave them the right advice. It's not like even the leaders were trying to say, Lead, follow me. But without a leader, they just didn't know how to function correctly in God. So for us, are we what kind of next generation leaders are we raising? Are we raising leaders that if you're not there, okay, they have initiative, they get things done, they sort it out, things function as normal? Or are we raising incapable leaders who, without your presence, nothing is working. And that is why our structure as church is so important, to raise mature believers who can pass on knowledge, who can, as they are leading, they are teaching someone else to lead. As they are functioning in these roles, they're enabling someone else to function in that role yeah. if they ever needed, if that role ever needed to be filled. You know, we must empower and teach one another and not raise a crippled generation of leaders. So, in terms of suggestions of how to raise good quality second generation leaders, what would we say? Yeah. We can be responsible. Yeah. Um, be responsible parents as in like, um, for the, uh, some, of, some of the answers given out of the first question that came. Be responsible in, in the way that um, we know that these children are us. We brought them to the world. So their well-being spiritually, physically, and mentally as much as financially depends on us parents. And not the teachers in the school, and not the economists, mm -hmm. nor the government. Mm -hmm. They will do their parts, but the fundamental of our children well being spiritually or physically is our responsibility. Yeah. Then we will arise more. I don't know why I'm so actually not parents. Because that's where we have this saying we have this saying that charity begins at home. So when, when we, the parents, have laid that foundation, that foundation has really been laid well, then a second generation can build on the good foundation. Because when the foundation is weak, obviously the building will collapse. Mm -hmm. But when it's, it's firm, nurtured, grown, sown into, with all the the... the the required and important um, elements and ingredients, then it can stand. Though they may, they may river here and there, but they will still align themselves. Because then they can draw from now, which has become a well in them, you know, to draw, go back and draw from there. Then. So even the really would not be to the extreme, they will just be, okay, made a mistake come back, okay, I'm falling this way. I yeah. will uh, not be that outright you know, rebellious kind of thing. So I think it's all to be clear with how much we invest into them, especially as spiritual things that in the Bible. How much? Because we tend to do the physical. 
more than the spiritual. So uh, as much as we put in the physical needs of them, we might we should as well put in their physical, invest in their physical, our time and every other thing. Yeah, and that can be transferred onto um, leadership because really as a leader the people you are looking after, mentoring, are people you are raising. Just like a parent raises a child. So as leaders, we have people we're raising. And as much as, yeah, we fulfill the practical and the mental, oh, you're moving home, I'll come and move home with you, and, you know, oh, you need some shopping, here's some money. There's also the spiritual side. And as much as a leader, you have to be willing to give that side and that time and that energy. The person receiving also has to want to receive it. Because if it's a one-way thing, that's another issue. You as a leader, you're trying to pour into someone, you know, this is what I've learned, this is, you know, what's helped me, this is how to, you know, be at the level I'm at. But they don't want, they don't want to be a leader, I just want to be a church member, babe. You know, you're asking too many questions, you're calling me too many times, every time you just want to pray, and, you know. <laughs> but that's how mature believers are raised. That's how what we've learned is passed on. Because someone took the time that really invested in us. You know, um, spiritually they were praying over us. Physically they were providing needs. Emotionally, you know, they were there with you, crying when you're crying, you know, joyful when you're jo They were there with you. So this is how I've been taught. This is what I know to do. This is what I'm doing for you. So um, as leaders, absolutely, we have to be willing to pour out. But those who are the next generation leaders have to be willing to receive. Because, indeed, it's not for our sake, it's for yours. Because our time will come and you have to step up. So I'm trying to equip you so that you don't stand there and you're just like, okay, first of all, I hadn't applied for this role. Second of all, <laughs> no one told me what this role involved. So, um, I want a refund, you know, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's no refund, no. So, we have to be willing for our leaders to pour into us. Yeah. Because honestly, when, if for some reason, you know, not really for some reason, when we now start branching out and, you know, building other churches, the leaderships will be going. Yeah. So, if all the leaders are going to build other churches and what's remaining is just church members, how the hell is this church going to survive? Because yeah. it has no structural leadership. So we have to A, pass it on, and be willing to receive so that we can all be first generation leaders. Fully equipped, fully trained, fully capable, and in full knowledge of the role. Yeah. In church, you're a leader. In church, you have the title. But in everyday life, we're leading. You're leading your children, you're leading your friends, you're leading your husband, or your I mean, you're leading your wife, you're leading even everyday life, even our children, you're leaders. There's people, your, your friends, you're leading them, sometimes even your teachers, because you know sometimes these teachers, especially the worldly ones, their ways, <laughs> you're also leading them in, this is how a Christian behaves. You might do that, but I don't believe in that. We're leading. So just because you don't want to accept the title, it does not take away the fact that in, even in everyday life, we're leading so we must apply those skills and be willing to be taught. And we will, in Jesus' name, all be first generation leaders. Amen. Okay, lesson four is the nature of God. Now, we know the nature of God, but there's some aspects of God that the book of Judges really brings out, which is one, be patient, because <laughs> for them to be on this cycle of sin, um, happening seven times. They sin, a leader is raised, the leader dies, there's a time of peace. They sin, a leader is raised, there's a... That went on and on and on. But he still was patient with them. He did not cast them out. He did not say, I've had enough of you disobedient children. I beg, let me raise another nation for myself. <laughs> he stuck with them. You know, he fulfilled the promise he had made to their grand, their forefathers. Yeah. So he was patient with them. He stuck with them. Even if they rejected him, he still accepted them. He's merciful. Because 
Who gives me one? Who gives me two? Who gives me two? Okay, we get to number six. Okay, this is ridiculous now. But <laughs> God is still going. <laughs> He's still going. Um, even in all their rebellion, even in all their idolatry, all their immorality, all the types of sins that they were committing. Because remember, they were supposed to enter this land and um, cast out the different tribes that were there already. God was going to take those tribes out bit by bit as the Israelites grew. Yeah. But instead of them now casting out these tribes bit by bit, they started to fellowship with them. You know, they started to hang around with them. Oh, Joseph, how you doing? Yeah, I'll see you at the club later on tonight. No! <laughs> You're not supposed to be at a club. I love them with Joseph. But they started to hang around with them. They're making friends with them. They People were supposed to chase out because of all the sin, the impure, everything they had done against God. All the just types of things they were doing. Sleeping with animals, sleeping with each other, um, their father's wives, and all sorts of things. You're supposed to cast them out because you're serving a holy God and God has called you to be holy and he's the one who makes you holy. So be holy. He had, those are his words to you. Be holy because I am holy. And instead, you're fellowshipping with those who are so sinful, his intention is to kick them out of that land. So, but he had mercy on them. This is not what he told them to do. This was not his plan, but he had mercy. He loves us unconditionally. Even if you refuse to love him, he loves you. That's the end of it. <laughs> Whether you don't know him, you, you know, uh, who's this God? I'm an atheist, whatever. God loves you. You who's declared your hatred for him and said how he doesn't exist and etc. etc. Example, so. He was going around destroying the church, killing Christian. You know, he hated God, truly. But God still wanted him. That same person, God still wanted him and chose him and loved him. God loves you. Now, this one, he delivers from and he delivers in to. Now, if we go to Judges 4. That's why. What? Yes. No? Okay. So we get to one and two. One. <coughs> and then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Now, this part, these two chapters, show us where God delivers into. Now, if you wish, God can deliver you out of your sin. He can deliver you out of your situation. He can deliver you from. But if you refuse, God can say, okay, fine, this is what you really want. I'll deliver you to them hands. And that's a scary thought, <laughs> actually. <laughs> that really, really, in our stubbornness, we can get to a place where God decides to just give us over to our sins and just let us be. I mean, I don't want to be given over to any sin. Lord, please, <laughs> don't ever deliver me to any kind of... No. But... This is a choice that actually we make. It's not what God plans, but it's like in the cycle of sin. 
they were being delivered from sin, being delivered from sin, God is delivering them. But then when the leader dies, they go back into immorality. So he delivers them into the oppressor of the land at that time. Oh, go to them. This is what you want. Go to them. This is what go to them. And then when they realize they're wrong, they cry out to him and he delivers them from. Me? No. <laughs> And we need to be careful as Christians because we can do this. We get into a, there's a one sin that you just haven't let go of. You haven't really let God deal with. So it keeps trapping you. You know, you, you're, whether it's, then because it's not an area you've really delivered and given over to God, it's a sin that keeps enticing you. It's a sin that keeps trapping you. You're on this vicious circle of sin, just going round and round for that one thing that you haven't really given over to God. Once God delivers us from, please, let us not even deliver ourselves back into. Yeah. Like, if it's an area of weakness that you know you have, be honest with God. God, this thing, I've tried. <laughs> I've tried to do it on my own. I've prayed. I've fasted. I haven't really told people because I feel ashamed. But Lord, you know my heart. I don't want to do this. <laughs> and just really, honestly, repent of it and be done with it. But... The Israelites hadn't repented of it. They continued because really they weren't sorry. They wanted a leader. It's almost like they're trying to show, Lord, we're trying to show you here, hello, we want a leader. Stop killing the leaders and taking them away. That's what we want. So, <laughs> so it's almost like their repeat of this sin was to spite God. Because I don't understand. But I just pray for us. We will not be like that. That God has delivered us from a situation and yet we keep putting ourselves back into it. We keep running back into that sin. You know, God has delivered you. He has freed you. He has called you free, to be free. Like, you're free. Stop running back into captivity. You know, stop running back to that same ungodly relationship. It's doing nothing for your life. That's not God's intention. This man is not going to marry you. I beg, stop running back to it. Um, whether it's those friends, the clubs, Christianity is what you make it. If you're not really into it, then it can be boring. But if you're into it, you're active, you're participating, you're in groups, just like any other thing, then it's interesting. And you won't need, you won't feel the urge for the clubs or whatever, because you're not missing anything. But you haven't really given it over to God, you kind of still really enjoy it. So you go, and you feel guilty afterwards. God has freed you. You don't, you don't need to be in that club with that friend that you should have left time ago. When you got saved, you really should have said goodbye to them. But you kept them on. I'm saved. I'll bring them along. Okay. After the first year or the first few months, you saw they're not coming. God told you, let them go. You refused. So now they've dragged you back into their cycle of sin. You're on that wheel with them, spinning, spinning, spinning. God just told you to be over here. You're spinning in sin. So, please, God has freed us. May we not deliver ourselves back into the hands of evil. Amen. So, I conclude. Yeah. <laughs> um, without God, really, we are on a never-ending cycle um, that's like a merry-go-round going nowhere. Just a merry-go-round of sin. Without God. Yeah, because there's people in the world who are nice people. And we know that. I have a name, but she's lovely. She's amazing. Um, but that doesn't take away the fact that her life, not having God at the center, is a cycle of sin. Really, as much as you're a nice person, as much as you know you try to dress right, you try to act right, you try to say the right things, if you don't have God, really, you're on a circle of sin that you need to be delivered from. E.g., now these days, on the surface, there ain't nothing wrong with that. Work is not a sin. Watching TV is not a sin. And sleeping is not a sin. Everybody does that. <laughs> that's not a sin. But that's your cycle. You're not going anywhere. You're repeating the same day over and over and over. You may as well be. Because without God, your life has no sense of purpose. You just, you live to pay bills. You're relaxing, you're watching a bit of TV, and then you sleep. That's the cycle you're on. It might not be sinful, but it's not going anywhere. There's no direction. 
and in between that, you know, I drinking, clubbing, and ungodly relationships. That's without God. But with God, uh, your with God, your life has a direction. Your life has a purpose. From the past, He will deliver you. He is with you in your present, and He has a future plan for you. Amen. So with God, we're no longer on this merry-go-round of hopelessness, of uselessness, of just you're living the same day over and over. Um, would you mind? I've never seen this film. But you know when a film is so popular, you don't even need to see it. You already know what changes it. You know, I think part of one of the scenes is an old schoolmate sees him on the street and he's like, oh, Johnny, what's up? One of them, instead of saying hi, he punches the guy and walks away. <laughs> As much as he changes the scene and does whatever, until he lives that day correctly, he does that play doesn't change on to the next. And really without God, yeah, your day changes here and there, you know, different issues arise here and there, and but really on the surface you live the same day over and over. That's that's not that's not a way to live. Um, but as Christians, we can be just like the Israelites being sorry about something, but not being willing to give it up. Yeah. Um, stop pretending to your cycle of sin and let God move you into a future. If we go to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. about um, how we are to raise next generation leaders. So how do we raise the next generation leaders? Um, something occurred to me which I want to uh, bring to our attention. One of the reasons why Joshua probably didn't have anybody to leave behind when he left was because his relationship with Moses is what ensured he would be the next generation leader. Elisha's relationship with Elijah is what ensured he would be the next leader, the next prophet. Timothy's relationship with Paul is what ensured he would be the next leader. Peter, James, and John's relationship with Christ is what ensured they will be the next generation leader. Now, 
going back to the Peter, James, and John, Jesus was around people physically, yet some did not allow him to lead them. I want to put it to you as a leader that most of the time, it's not that the leader does not want to pass on to the next generation. The next generation sometimes has no time for the leader. Because the next generation is so consumed with their job, their family, their fashion, their ladies' hairdo, the men's haircut, the, men's haircut, <laughs> the nice beard, and whatever else, food, and whatever else they have that is a stumbling block for them to give themselves over to somebody else to lead them. That's the problem. So really, if we're looking for next generation leaders, my question is, how ready are we to give ourselves over to someone else? Because it takes time for you to become a leader. It takes, it's a process. You know, somebody asked me, one of the interviews I did for an online magazine, are leaders born or made? I said, absolutely, absolutely, without a shadow of doubt, leaders are made. Everybody has the ability to be a leader, but not everybody will become a leader because leaders are simply made. And you've got to have time to be a leader. Simple. See how much, see what the disciples had to give up, the apostles had to give up to become who they were. They left their business, they left their family. You know, I was saying to my wife the other day, I said, you know, how did Peter's wife pay, pay the bills? Because when Peter came back, it's like, yeah, where's the money? You know, Junior hasn't had any fruit. <laughs> because we know that Peter was married. And he probably had children. But he still had to sacrifice his time to be become who he was. So it's more like, you know, do you have the time? to actually invest in your own leadership for your future, yeah? So, of course, from a leader's point of view, some leaders shy away from investing in other people because it's costly. It, it costs you time, it costs you money, it costs you energy, it's very painful, you know? Yeah, some people may shy away from that. But I think, you know, I haven't known quite a few leaders, I think it's more the other way, you know? Like I said to, I think I was saying to the Jennifer, uh, most of us have heard me talk about David Pawson. You go to David Pawson's house, you can book an appointment to see him. Nobody's there. Nobody goes to see him. Wow. Me, nobody goes to see David Pawson here. Nobody goes to see him. Everybody wants him to disciple them from afar. Because that's more convenient. You know, so it's more about what are we ready to invest? The second thing I wanted to draw our attention to is where um, our teacher for tonight was talking about, uh, I think it was the first lesson, about men and women. Um, the fact that God raised the judges in the book of Judges were actually uh, uh, men who went to battle. Um, you know, like you all know when you, when you watch any kind of... Uh, uh, movie that involves the, the Israelites, or even in the news, you know that Israel is the only nation that tends to lose a lot of their commanders and, and, and top official, top officials of the army because they are still the only country today that go to war uh, with their commanders. In the British and um, and many other countries, they stay back in the in the barracks. Yeah. You know, they press the buttons, but their actual their their, their officials go to war. Anyway. You will notice there that um, the judges went to war. So when, when Deborah, or Deborah, whichever, however you want to pronounce it, Deborah, Deborah, Debbie, let's stay with Debbie. If she, <laughs> Debs. Um, <laughs> Debs, yeah, yeah. Don't say another one, we have enough now. Um, so if that person was saying, you know, Barack was saying to her, I'm not going to war unless you go. You know what that is today? 
What is war for us today? What is war for the Christian today? For the weapons are warfare. Spiritual. 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 Yeah, it's a spiritual battle. It's prayer. Thank you. It's prayer. So, if a man trusts his wife's prayer more than his own, it's like Barak. If deep in your heart you know what I'm saying is true, it concerns you, you trust your wife's prayer more than your prayer, you are living like Barak. It's like saying, dear, you pray. You always hear God. God always speaks to you. You know where God is. In fact, you and God are buddies. So you do the prayer. Whatever he says is what I will do. You are living like Barak. It should be the other way around. It should be Barak saying... Or Barak. Which one should we say? Barak or Barak? Barak. Barak. <laughs> Barak. Barak. That's another one you just said. Barak. Barak. Okay, Barak. Okay. Let's say Barak. Let's start Barack Obama. Okay. Barak was saying to Deborah, I'm not going to this battle unless you go with me. It's like I don't trust myself in God, but I trust you. As men. If we're still doing that, we're operating in the Barak spirit. We're supposed to be operating the Jephthah spirit, my friends. Yes, sir. That's the one that is ready to go face battle. You know, even things like prayer, sharing the word. Men prefer to stay back. Let the women do it. Sadly, we're still having the, that issue in church. Not only in our church, in church. This is ought not to be so. Finally, turn your Bibles to this. We don't talk about Jephthah enough, so I love him. Uh, and, I, and I think we can learn a lot from him. Judges, chapter 11. This is where we start. Judges 11. He's, you know, this guy, Jephthah, is so unique in his role as a judge. It's amazing how he, how he lived, and uh, you know, I, I really feel we can all learn something from this man of God here. When we talk about Jephthah, we always refer to his rash promise to God. He's the one who promised that whatever came out of his house, he was going to sacrifice to God as a burnt offering. But, you know, if you understand your Bible correctly and you've read the whole Bible, you should be able to know that he never really burnt the daughter alive. But that's your problem if you want to think he burnt it, because God is not interested in human sacrifice. You know, the only sacrifice God wanted was himself, Jesus. There's no other person that's good enough to sacrifice himself for him. Okay. Right, let me not confuse you. Right, so, Jephthah, now read from verse 1. Jephthah the Gideon was a mighty warrior. No other person is used as, oh well, uh, Gideon also, uh, mighty man of valor. He says here, his father was Gideon and his mother was a prostitute. So already from birth, he had no chance of being a leader. Completely ruled out. Okay? But then it says, Gideon's wife also bore him sons. And when they, grew, when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You were not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Top, where a group of adventurous or oh, lawless men gathered around him and, he, and followed him. So already the guy had something in him that made him think, my goodness, I can still be better than what my brothers have just done to me. It was a cast out person. It was cast out from his family. Jephthah uh, uh, said to them, okay, now there is war. You know what people are like when they need you, they come. Now, now there is war. Jephthah, let me read from verse 4. Sometime later, the Ammonites made war on Israel. The elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me out of my father's house? But what he's saying is, actually, when his family drove him out, all the elders were there by the door, going, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you, you go away. Mm -hmm. That's what they did to him. 
But you know what really blessed me about Jephthah? Was when the king of the Ammonites sent a letter to him. And Jephthah's response showed what? If you read the book of Judges, what did Jephthah's response to the king of Ammon show? Knowledge, his of his history. Knowledge, history, the depth in God like no one else had at that time or like never before. So the point I'm making is whilst Jephthah was cast out, whilst he was going through a struggle time, guess what he was doing? He was getting himself Recouped. prepared and also building his relationship, his relationship with God in a deep way. That's why God would call them to go call him. Because he had used that time to have a deep relationship with God. In our trouble time, are you using that to have a deeper relationship with God? Or are you spending it just crying? Because crying don't change nothing. I say, well, I wept and so God heard me. No, when you wept, you were able to hear God. <laughs> That's right. That's all that happened. Your tears, your fasting makes you hear God. Your fasting doesn't change God. It changes you. Because he's always speaking and he's always there. So I'm saying to us, when we're going through difficult times, let's use that time to really uh, grow up in God. So that when we come out of it, we can also be of help and value to other people. But Jephthah is one I want you to please read and study. We don't have time to really go a lot into it because we've already had a lot of very good stuff today. The thing about this next generation, um, every parent, every...